The World's Greatest Stories, brought to you by Nelson Olmsted. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight for the first time in this series, Nelson Olmsted has closed his eyes to the title of this program to bring you a short story which is not one of the world's greatest. In fact, it isn't even published. But it does concern Christmas today and in the distant future, perhaps 300 years from now. Here is Nelson Olmsted with an especially written story, Tomorrow's Fall. That morning, I arose early, stirred by a restlessness which provoked me to walk to my assembly instead of using the transport. On the way, I became enthralled with the sparkling beauty of the countryside, which was as if it had been softly sprayed with snow the night before. Consequently, when I arrived at the administration of instruction building and, with cap in hand, tiptoed to the door of my assembly, the morning convocation had already started. Immediately, I stopped, turned to the picture at the head of the room, bowed my head, and joined the boys, repeating... He strengthens me when I'm weak. He cares for me when I'm not well. He feeds me when I'm hungry. I am eternally grateful to my high leader and the brotherhood of men. And then, as we sang the marching song of youth, I continued tiptoeing to my place, but not, however, escaping the sharp eye of Director Frederick, who said, Paul, see me after hours. Yes, sir, I answered weakly, fearing the lecture and punctuality I would surely receive. And yet, in spite of his severity... He was a kind man, whom I admired and liked more than any of the directors I'd studied under all the years I'd gone to assembly. When the day's hours were over, I walked slowly to his room, knocked on the door, and went in. Oh, Paul. Director Frederick, I- I'm ashamed of having been late this morning. Yes, yes, but that's not what I called you in for, Paul. In another week, on New Year's first day, you will be celebrating the close of your instructions. How do you feel? About growing up, I mean. I... I'm not sure I know, Director. What do you mean? Well, you... <laughs> I don't know exactly how to say it. I... Go on, Paul. Tell me what it is. You can trust me. I know I can. So tell me, why do I have to be an agriculturalist? Why? Well, Paul, you know as well as I do, that was determined by the high leader long before you were ever born. Yes, I know. Never since I've been five, I've studied nothing else. Director Frederick, I don't think I like agronomy. What? Have you told this to anybody else, Paul? No. I've tried to talk to my father about it, but he won't listen. He tells me I'm stupid. Well, promise me one thing. You'll never mention this to anyone else. No. There isn't anyone else but you I can talk to. Good. You know, of course, the penalty for dissatisfaction. You know what would happen to you. But it's not dissatisfaction exactly, Director. That, that isn't it at all. I can't explain it in words. It's uh, just a sort of feeling that I've missed something all these years. Learning nothing but how to write and talk and cultivate. Paul, Paul. Do you realize that, strictly speaking, it is my duty to have you sent to the institution of correction? You won't do that, will you, Director? No. No. Any other youth, I might, but not you, Paul. Perhaps I can help you. I want you to realize the full benefits of the age in which we live, Paul. What is it you think you've missed? Well, not all the boys take the same instructions as I, do they? No. Each concentrates on the subject of his destination in the Brotherhood of Men, just as you've studied little other than agronomy. Some are instructed in mechanics, some in construction, some in direction, as I was. Do you think you would like to have been instructed in something else besides agronomy? No, I don't think that would have made any difference. Good. I'm glad to hear you say that. Perhaps you are headed for the institution, as I thought a moment ago. What do you want, Paul? Well, that's just it. I, I, I'm not sure. Something seems to be missing, Director Frederick, and 
I don't know what it is. Well, I'll answer any question that might clarify your mystery, Paul. That's why I called you here this afternoon. I knew that something was on your mind. Well, tell me what... Well, what the world was like before the Brotherhood of Men. Does anyone know? Oh, yes, Paul. Those who are chosen for administration are instructed as to the glaring defects in the life of man before the world is perfected. What makes you ask? I don't really know. I realize that I'm here, that my father's been here longer than I have, that his father's still longer, and... Oh, I'm beginning to see your trouble. You want to know what... Well, say, what your great-grandfather's great-grandfather was like. Is that it? I think so. Uh, was he instructed in agronomy like me and my father? No, Paul, I doubt it. You see, back in that age, your forefather lived in a peculiar world. He didn't have directed instruction as you have. He went to assembly for a few years, perhaps, and studied a little of this and a little of that, never learning very much about any one thing. He did? Well, then, how did he serve the Brotherhood of Men? That's what I'm getting at, Paul. You see, it wasn't the Brotherhood of Men then. It was a government that lacked all of the efficiency and exactitude that we enjoy today. In fact, they used to say it was a government for the people. Instead of everyone working for one great association of men as we do, men were supposed to make the government and the leader work for them the way they desired. I don't understand. No, it's, it's hard to explain. Perhaps this will help. In that time, each man considered himself, shall we say, an absolute individual. In other words, he was instructed in what he liked. He worked as and if he liked. He was ununified. Some men were able to work better than others. Some lived in unbelievable luxury, while others had barely enough to eat. The inequality of people was appalling. There was none of the cooperation among men that we have today, because they lived their own lives, because they thought themselves to be the important thing, and the state or government the secondary. Each man worked out his own life, resulting in a dreadful muddle. At times, there would be too many men for certain jobs and not enough for others. We have none of that today, of course, due to the exact and absolute planning for which we must thank our leaders. Today, it has seen, too, that just enough men are prepared for the work necessary for a unified brotherhood of men. I see. But if they consider themselves so important, what must they thought about? Hmm. What must they thought about, eh? Well, I suppose that's a fair question. Let me see. For one thing, they believed that somewhere around their bodies was an abstract thing which they called a soul. A soul? Yes, a soul. They used this, uh, this soul of theirs to explain a great many things that otherwise would have been unanswerable to them. For instance, they were convinced that some super being created them, placed them on earth, guided their lives, and when they died, took their soul to his place for the remainder of time. This super being they could never see nor hear, nor could they determine any outward signs of his existence, though he was supposed to have placed on earth his own son to demonstrate the intricacies of the belief. But this super being and his son affected their lives, they avowed, through their souls. And this worship guided the lives of most of your predecessors, Paul. I see. I, I suppose this, um, this soul must have given these men a lot of satisfaction, didn't it? Yes, Paul. I imagine you can call it satisfaction. But it was built on emotion. On petty emotion. And we must be grateful for the fact that today we have nothing in aim in our emotional training. I see, Director Frederick. Have I helped your restlessness, Paul? Yes, thank you. Well, I'm pleased then. With this, I walked away from his room and ran out into the open. My mind was full of what he told me of those strange people who lived in the world in the past. And yet, I still experienced that sensation of having missed something. Of... Well, I still couldn't express it, even after his talk. For several hours, I hardly knew where I walked, trying to give my very baffling problem some thought, which might help to soothe that indescribable fire burning within me. It was dark when I arrived at the family quarters, the night was crisp and cold, and my breath made unusually great clouds of vapor as I breathed. I almost walked in, when suddenly I saw a light in one of the smaller livestock buildings. My first thought was that Father was having trouble with some of the animals and might need help. So I walked in that direction. 
On approaching the building, I was puzzled as to the kind of light that shone from within. It was like nothing I could remember seeing before. And I wondered at its source. Slowly, I opened the door and walked in. Father wasn't there. Instead, there stood a man. Beside whom lay a woman on the bedding of the floor. And to my greatest surprise, in one of the open feeders, there lay a tiny baby. All around which shone a bright and yet softly luminous light. For some reason I cannot possibly explain, I fell to my knees in front of this child and held my hands together. And as suddenly as I did this, there came over me a great peace, a calm serenity, a growing thankfulness for something I couldn't explain and had never felt before. Whether I spoke to this man and woman, I can't remember. But I did remain there several hours. And while I did, other people, some of whom I knew and others who were strangers came in, dropped to their knees as I had, and spoke not one word. For there was nothing to say. The speech seemed so empty and useless. It was the feeling that permeated all of us. Later, as I slowly walked out the door, I looked up to the sky, and there was the moon. No, not the moon, but a huge bright star, sending all of its light, so it seemed, down in this little building. And I questioned nothing, for in me was the peace I'd sought so long. This has been the story of Tomorrow's Paul, an original Christmas narrative written especially for this program. Now, here is Nelson Olmstead with a closing word. Regular listeners to this program probably expected me to review the greatest of all Christmas stories tonight. And, of course, I mean The Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. However, since it is so universally great, practically everyone reads or dramatizes it during the season of the year. And we simply didn't want to repeat it for you. Hence the explanation of tomorrow's Paul. This is the first time we presented an original unpublished story in the series. And for that reason, your reaction to it would be helpful in guiding our future policy. I'm especially interested in your opinion, you see. Because I wrote it. Good night and good reading. <laughs>